Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to episode 3 of Flusters Topics. Today we have a lot of topics. David Krejci retiring. We're going to be recapping the Jaguars' first preseason game. And if you stick around till the end, I have two movie reviews and a song review. So let's get into it. All right, well, with David Krejci officially announcing his retirement this past Monday, three, three active Boston Bruin players from that 2011 Stanley Cup Finals team remain. Brad Marshan, Milan Lucic, and of course for the Dallas Stars, Tyler Sagan. That is 12 years ago. Oh my god. But anyways, David Krejci, his career, over a thousand regular season games with the Bruins. He's coming off a 56-point season. He scored in Game 7 against Florida. Overall, a very solid career. You know, I don't know if he's good enough to get his number retired or even make the Hall of Fame. He's not a Hall of Fame lock like Patrice Bergeron is. But could I see Krejci getting in down the road? Potentially. From 2004 to this past year, he spent his entire career with the Bruins organization. And my first ever Bruins game I attended, Bruins-Panthers. March 4th, 2014, David Krejci scored a hat-trick. Yep, the first ever Bruins game I attended in person, Krejci scored a hat-trick. Bruins won 4-1. to one. Jerome McGinley, funny enough, scored the non-Krejci goal, but it was fantastic. Great experience there, and overall, you know, I just love watching David Krejci as a kid. I wish him the best of luck in retirement, and I hope to see him in Toronto one day getting inducted. But again, compared to Bergeron, that's a long shot. But David Krejci, great career. Thank you for your service for the Boston Bruins. All right, now shifting gears from hockey to football, we're going to talk about some preseason topics. First and foremost, my beloved Jacksonville Jaguars started off their preseason with the 28-23 dub over the Dallas Cowboys this past Saturday. But obviously... I gotta talk about two things. One, Trevor Lawrence played the first two drives. He threw a terrible interception on the first drive. He overshot, I want to say it was Evan Ingram, maybe Calvin Ridley. Anyways, Trevor threw it about five yards over his head and it landed right in the arms of a Cowboy defender. I'm nervous that Trevor is becoming the next Josh Allen. The guy who's going to have the strong arm, he's going to lead his team to, you know, future playoff success. But at the same time, I think he's going to be throwing a lot of interceptions while doing that. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. But I would be remorse without talking about two players for the Jaguars. Obviously one, Nathan Rourke, 24 years old, coming straight out of the CFL. He just had to play the preseason. He avoids four sacks is literally throwing the ball while getting sacked, has the arm strength and the accuracy to find Quandre Olsen for the touchdown. That was the last Jaguars touchdown of the game, which pretty much put the game away. Nathan Rourke, man, I've been saying it since we signed him back in February or March. He should be the QB2 instead of C.J. Beathard. We know what we're getting as C.J. Beathard. You might have lightning in a bottle with Nathan Rourke. If he really earns that QB2 job, please let him back up Trevor. And the other player on the defensive side of the ball that really impressed me was Yasir Abdullah, the defensive end. He's coming out of Louisville. He had 14 and a half tackles for loss in 13 games last year with nine and a half sacks and two interceptions. He looked very solid and he was really pressuring Will Greer in the second half. Overall, pretty good game for the Jaguars overall. I can't say that. You know, nothing glaring other than that Trevor interception really concerned me. It was really nice to see what Parker Washington, Tank Bigsby, Antonio Harrison, what these rookies could do. It was really nice to see him. Overall, very impressed with the Jaguars this past week. And let's see how they do against Detroit next Saturday. Well, uh, so we know that... <laughs> The Jaguars start off with a win, and we know that the 49ers started their preseason with, preseason with a loss, but we got to talk about Trey Lance. Uh, 
He threw a touchdown, which should have been an interception. The cornerback literally, the ball bounced off his hands, and then Ross Dwelly, one of the 49ers tight ends, caught it for a touchdown. Stupidly lucky thrown touchdown. Very inconsistent. He was under duress a lot. He was running out of the pocket way too quickly. He didn't feel comfortable, and he was getting sacked quite a bit. You look at the stat sheet and say, well, 10 for 15 with a 66.7 completion percentage and 112 yards with a touchdown. Is it really that bad? Watch the highlights. I thought Trey Lance was terrible, and this is a man who I said would finish top three in MVP voting. That was last year. <laughs> and then he had a terrible game against Chicago in terrible weather, and they tore his ACL, and I get it. This is his first game since last September, but oh my god, he looked awful. Sam Darnold didn't look much better, so I guess Lance would still be the QB2 at the moment. But, I mean, God, if per Brock Purdy is 100%, it is a no-brainer you start him week one against the Steelers. Uh, listen, I really like Trey Lance. I thought he was going to take that Jalen Hurts-esque leap last year. He did not. He got injured, and then he comes out and plays a, literally Nathan Rourke. A guy from the CFL had a better preseason game than a third overall pick in the draft. I couldn't believe it. You know, is Trey Lance's career over? No, it's just one preseason game. But am I disappointed in him? Absolutely. We'll see how he does the rest of the preseason. He's one of the players I am going to be watching a ton of highlights and film from. All right, and I guess last, well, not our last NFL topic, but our last news topic Dalvin Cook officially signed with the New York Jets, and Ezekiel Elliott officially signed a one-year deal with the Patriots. This doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I guess it does, but the Jets have Brees Hall, and the Patriots have Ramondre Stevenson. Those are two very capable running backs when healthy. Maybe if the Patriots wanted to target Ezekiel Elliott, like, strictly as a power back, and they try to, you know, open up Stevenson to more roles in the offense, I Yes, I can agree with that. But the Jets getting Dalvin Cook, I mean, he, yeah, at the moment, he's better than Brees Hall. But I don't know, if I was Dalvin Cook, I felt like I just would have went elsewhere. Like, they have Brees Hall, who is fully healthy, who just got off the PUP list this past weekend. Like, Brees Hall's ready to go, and he had a great, what, six games, I believe, before he tore his ACL last year. Again, maybe Brees Hall, the injury concerns, that's why they grabbed Cook for a year, but I can't wait to see Brees Hall exploding year three next year if he can stay healthy. Dalvin Cook, I guess it's a one-year prove-it deal. I expect both running backs to get probably over 700 rushing yards uh, for the Patriots. I'll probably go with Stevenson gets about probably seven or 800. He really could be a 1,000 yard rusher, but getting an Elliott probably prevents that from happening. I'm going to go Zeke gets 400 touchdown or 400 yards, not 400 touchdowns. And probably, yeah, four or five touchdowns. That's probably going to be Zeke's stat line. For Dalvin Cook and Brees Hall, I have them both pretty much literally equal. 700 yards apiece, seven or eight rushing touchdowns apiece. The, the Jets just got better, and, you know, I was very, like, I don't know if the Jets are better than the Dolphins yet. I think with Dalvin Cook, they, they may have passed Miami, but I'm not really buying into the Jets hype yet, and you'll see that when I predict every game in a couple of weeks when I film that video, but, you know, they, they, they got a great roster on paper, and you got to credit New York for that. All right, real quick and real sensitive, but Wanda Franco... Allegedly going out with a 14-year-old girl. I'm just going to make this very short and sweet. If Ronda Franco is indeed doing this, he knows it. He should never play a game for the Rays organization ever again. With that being said, if the girl is over 18 and is accusing Wanda Franco of false accusations, Wanda Franco should be inserted right back in the Rays lineup and the girl should go to jail. I'm just going to leave it at that. Take that as you will. That's my opinion. Take that as you will. Innocent till proven guilty, but the pictures, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll, this is a developing story. Currently, the news broke on Sunday. We're just going to see how the rest of this plays out before I talk about it anymore.
All right, shifting gears back to football, we're going to talk about two documentaries. First and foremost, though, we're going to talk about, well, we're going to talk about the Johnny Manziel Netflix documentary and the other Netflix series, Quarterback. First, I'm going to talk about the Manziel documentary because I did think that was a little bit of the more lackluster one. Johnny Manziel does have a very interesting story, and the fact that this is just one one hour and 12 minute documentary, it's way too short. You could have made three or four 30, 40 minute episodes and it would have been much better. Uh, we get to hear, you know, all the crazy stuff he did with his money. He was upset at the SEC because he wasn't getting any money for jersey merchandise sales at Texas A&M. And they talked a lot about high school football in Texas A&M. That done to a T. The NFL... Oh my goodness, after draft day, I'm not going to lie, uh, he, he just, yeah, I get it. He lost passion for football. He didn't care playing for the Browns, but they rarely dove into it. All they talked about was, oh, he didn't study. His agents making fun of him half the time, and his parents just like, wow, like we can't believe our son just blew his chance of becoming a professional quarterback. You know, it's very a sad story, you know, he almost committed suicide, and obviously that's a touching moment, and you know, it's, it's just a terrible situation, but, you know, the aspect of having, you know, his best friend there, his agent there, his parents there, Cliff Kingsbury doing the analysis, you know, like, that's good, interviewing them, that's good, but they could have done more people. How about when Manziel joined the Browns in 2014? Why not have Brian Hoyer, the quarterback he was competing against for the starting job, why not bring him in as a guest speaker? How about you talk about his best game as a pro week two, 2015 against the Tennessee Titans? Like, the Browns segment just felt rushed, and then they didn't even mention the fact that he played in the CFL, AFF, and, um, Fan Control Football League afterwards, you know, just like, it felt very rushed, and it didn't need to be. Again, I think if they split this up in three or four segments, you split it up by, like, high school and Texas A&M success. The second episode is about, um, I guess, going to the NFL at that point, and then just, I guess, losing passion for football. The third episode can kind of be about, you know... This trips all the other sports leagues, and then the fourth could be, you know, about his life, the wrong decisions he made. Another guest speaker I wanted to see on the show was Bob Memory. Disappointed we didn't see him, but whatever. Overall, I would probably give it like a 7 out of 10. It wasn't terrible. Definitely watch it if you're interested. I'm not saying don't, but it does feel rushed, and it gives you the brief. Johnny Manziel story, but I don't know, for like a Netflix documentary, I wanted, I guess, like more in-depth, more conclusive stuff, but overall, it was decent. Now, quarterback, on the other hand, well, that was significantly better than decent. I give this a nine and a half, nine and a half out of ten. This was absolutely done to a T, perfection, from covering Patrick Mahomes to Kirk Cousins to Marcus Mariota. At times, this is where I gotta give it 9.5 out of 10 and not 10 out of 10. At times, you completely forgot Marcus Mariota was part of the story. And I get it. He is a low bridge starting quarterback compared to a Pro Bowl caliber quarterback like Kirk Cousins and the Super Bowl winning quarterback Patrick Mahomes. I get that. But they really... At times, when they did not need to mention Mariota, they did not. And I, like, you know, it, it was good to know that, like, the media was overreacting, myself included. When Mariota walked away from the Falcons, his wife was pregnant. So, let's, you know, we, we need to slam Marcus Mariota for that, right? I've always been a huge Kirk Cousins guy. You guys know that if you've been subscribed to the channel. But just, I, I knew he was a family man, but oh my goodness, he, he really goes above and beyond for his wife and his kids. Really cool stuff there. And then Mahomes, yeah, Brittany Mahomes is annoying. Luckily, you don't see Pat, uh, Jackson Mahomes like at all. Brittany Mahomes is, you know, less toxic than, I guess, clips you would see of her online. You see kind of a different side of her, which is good. And then obviously Mahomes, he's always kind of been that come humble, cool dude. So... 
quarterback, they did a really nice job covering their lives on and off the field. I really liked it. So 9.5 out of 10. Again, just felt like next time just, just get a better quarterback than Mariota. Like a quarterback you can probably cover just as equally as a guy like Kirk. And it definitely works. I, I loved it. All right. Well, thank you for sticking with me. We have gone through all the sports topics. Now we're going to talk about a song recommendation and two movies I have recently watched. First, we're going to get rid of the song. And it is called Runaway by Cicely Rose. So pretty much this song came out on June 23rd, if I'm not mistaken. And... Cecily Rose, what to talk about her? It has great guitar, great drums, and it's a mixture of a Kelly Clarkson like background song. And Cecily Rose has the voice very close to Avril Lavangi. I liked it. It is kind of like a punk rock, like, you know, girl as the lead singer. But I really liked it. You know, I was just scrolling through TikTok or Twitter. That song came up, you know, in my bio. And I was like, eh, I'd check it out. It was pretty good. So shout out to Cicely Rose, uh, Vinny Preserto, and Mark Mar Mac Target. There we go. For uh, producing the song. Because overall, that was that was, that was a banger. It, it definitely got added to my playlist. Go check it out. It's only like three minutes long. And now on to the two movies. We're just going to rip this band-aid off right away. I saw Barbie. Oh, and let me give you my honest opinion on this. Was it the worst movie you're ever going to see in your life? No. It actually had quite a few funny moments in it. But, you know, as a guy, uh, it, it also had its very cringy moments, I felt. You know, the only thing that made me feel good was I wasn't the only guy in the movie theater watching it. I may have been the only single guy in the movie theater watching it, but I was not the only guy watching it in that theater at that showing. And, you know, I also wasn't the only guy who ended up chuckling a couple of times. It's a good movie for, you know, if you want to go out on a date or you want to chill at your house with your girlfriend or whatever throw on a movie that'll make her happy it's that type of movie but you know if you've seen it great you probably like it or absolutely despise it I, i'm in the middle because i'm like yeah it wasn't the worst movie ever but it was far from the best and i'm like you know all this hullabaloo it makes sense why you know this is such a huge movie and it's breaking box office records. I get it because it's Barbie and it's really popular, but you know, just from my guy perspective, I saw it. I didn't think it was awful. I didn't think it was outstanding, but you know, it was a cute movie if you wanted to watch with you know a fellow girlfriend or you know take a friend out to the movies or whatever. It, it, it's that type of movie, and that's not a bad thing. So overall, I probably give it like. A seven out of ten, I guess. Oh my god, I got the same rating as the Johnny Manziel documentary. I'm sure that will sit well with other individuals, but now, really, I mean, if you want to watch it, cool. If you don't want to watch it personally, I don't think you're missing anything crazy, but it's worth a watch if you're surrounded by the right people. But now for the movie that you absolutely need to watch, and that is The Man Named Otto. Tom Hanks does a great job being not only a producer, but the lead actor in this movie. He is basically a stereotypical, like, grumpy old man. He's lost his wife, so he's depressed. He's contemplating suicide. And all of a sudden, you know, these very obnoxious new neighbors who are in their 20s, you know, they move in next door. They don't know anything, according to the old man, so he gets all grumpy with them. But as the movie goes on, he begins to appreciate their company more and his little cul-de-sac's company more. And overall, he found that missing joy that he's been missing since his wife passed away. And that's about all I'll go into. But let's just say it's a tearjerker. Even me, who rarely cries over movies, TV shows, even I shed a tear when this one concluded. Again, 
funny moments, but man, is the overall subject topic that it's heavy. It is heavy, but it is definitely a recommendation. And I guess that's going to do it for uh, Flusters Topics Episode 3. I hope you guys have been enjoying this. Will live commentaries be coming back? They're coming back soon. I, my goal is to commentate Jaguars, Lions, or Patriots, Packers on Saturday. And that will be my first live broadcast since Golden Knights, Panthers, Game 5. I know it's been that long. I've been busy, but watching Barbie and Johnny Manziel documentaries and other stuff, but you know, it's all right. We're, we're going to be hopefully commentating a couple of preseason games before week one and not going to talk about it, but today it was announced that Anthony Richardson will be the starting quarterback. So when we broadcast our first Jaguars game in week one, it's going to be against Anthony Richardson. So that'll be fun. I, I cannot wait. That's what, three weeks away, give or take now? You know, it's, it's going to be such an exciting time moving back into college and NFL season is going to be starting up, which is where I love to produce content the most So during the year. So I'm excited for that, but I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, hit that like button, and I'll see you guys in Fluster's Topics Episode 4.